Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another one of my videos. I just arrived down here at the National Marine Corps Museum, as you can see in the, behind me there. I haven't been here since 2019 before COVID hit, and COVID screwed up everything. So I'm back. I, uh, today I want to focus on just mostly just the World War II collection in here, because that's, that's mostly my biggest part of my history that I like. So let's go inside and take a look. Well, we just walked in here. We're in the main lobby now. It's got a Corsair way up there. You can't even see it. All right, this here is an awesome setup here. We're hitting the beaches of Tarawa. This guy's wounded. Got another one going over the seawall. It's one of the best displays they got in here. This thing's really awesome. And they made this as realistic looking as possible. You can see this, the seawater coming up to the sand there. And they got spent cartridges and clips in there and the boot prints in the sand. Looks so real. We got some spent 50 caliber machine gun rounds. Right there, you can see a seashell. A couple of them. And these here are palm trees that they use to make a seawall out of for protection. And right above there, there's a Dauntless Dive Bomber. And here it is breaking over the top. And right behind that Marine is a Corsair. Another close up here of the mannequins. It's one of my favorite museums in the whole country I've been in. Uh, just ate lunch here on the second floor at the Tun Tavern. Excellent food. Very good. If you ever come down here, I recommend eating here. All right, now we'll get a little bit of a closer view of the Corsair here. It's an F4U model. All right, here's the uh, Dauntless Dive Bomber. These were famous during the Battle of Midway. Right, here's the front view of the Dauntless Dive Bomber. Get some close up here. All right, I'm coming into the World War II section now, and I think this here is one of the nicest displays I've ever seen. It's a corpsman taking care of a marine. Got all the gear laying out. This thing's amazing. Buys my bottle on, on the rifle. They make it so realistic looking. Yeah, 
and inside the helmet here you can see a picture of his wife or girlfriend and the baby. It would be the victorious allies vowed the war to end all wars. Only two allied nations emerged from the war with their economies intact and See all the original Japan gear. Took control of Germany's possessions in China and the Pacific. The Marines cartridge the belt, Formosa, canteen that just Taiwan got wounded. And Korea. But it was China that would become the main focus of their territorial ambitions. In 19... Alright, here's a little display of uh, as World War II started for the United States. You can see the lady is listening to the radio, and apparently they, she just heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. You can see on the floor there, she dropped her cup and saucer. She's got her hand over her face there, like, like she's totally surprised, which I'm sure like everybody was. There's her daughter saying, oh my God, we're at war. Now here's a bugle that actually was blown during an attack on Pearl Harbor. And the book here is the Sergeant of the Guard logbook during the attack on Pearl Harbor. And then down here, what we're going to have is a temperature gauge from a Japanese Zero and a shell fragment. These were picked up at Pearl Harbor right after the attack. Now here's a really cool display. Take notice that the Marines wearing khakis and he's got a uh, Kelly helmet on. And he's manning a Browning water cooled 30 caliber machine gun. And you can see all the spent casings laying down there. Now this flag here flown on Wake Island during the attack. Sorry about the glare, but it's going to be a lot of reflection in here. There's a really nice mesh kit that's engraved. Got a pistol belt with an EGA on it. And here's a shoulder patch from the 4th Marines, Company M. Growing up in Milwaukee, I didn't know about the separate water fountains right in the back of the bus. Uh, I just let you know that this is about now you want to fight for this country to do it where you can have segregation, and uh, which I, I think was wrong. Some of the guys started fighting for the country, and we got back home that things were messed around. And here's the tank crew, it's a Stewart tank. You notice the one Marine, he's handing up shells so they can reload the tank. Now we're getting into the Marine Corps Raiders and parachute battalions. There's the rising machine gun. A Johnson rifle. There's the boys anti-tank rifle. 
and right above us is a wildcat fighter. These were used early in the war. And we're coming into the weapons display. Got a flamethrower. Some Japanese hand grenades. One on the left is made out of porcelain and the other two are metal fragmentation grenades. There's an air, ring, air raid siren. And then we got the Japanese sword. There's the front and the back of a metal that was just, oh, I think that was on Guadalcanal. Come back again. It's called the George Metal. Now we've got a nice display here of a couple Marines manning a 37 millimeter anti-tank gun. They got these mannequins looking so real. You can actually see some sweat on their bodies and dirt, some cuts. They got got this looking really nice. There he's handing a round to the next guy so he can load it. Now we've got a nice Jeep display here. Marine Air Group 24. See how realistic these mannequins look. Get a close up of this guy. Here's a life vest worn by pilots, and here's the pilot's knee board. They would strap on their knees so they can take notes and whatever. This belonged to uh, Kenneth Walsh. He's a Marine Corps ace during World War II. There's a Smith & Wesson Victory model. Revolver and a holster for it. There's a nice jacket of a P-42 jacket. There's a jacket that was worn by Cape Gloucester. It's got the 1st Marine Division patch on it. There's some information on Major Gregory Pappy Bullington. Some of you may remember the TV series Bob Bob Black Sheep back in the late 70s. That was him on there. I actually got to meet him in 1984 at an air show, just a few years before he passed away. Got his autograph, a picture autograph of him, and a signed book. Then they got a theater in here. Show cartoons and home front stuff. And here they're showing a movie. They got three hours instead, since the Navy wanted to maintain the advantage of surprise. 
Now here's a really nice diorama. Rode in their guns and began blasting Amtrak's and landing craft out of the water. Marines tumbled into the chest deep water to slowly work their way hundreds of yards to the beach. Cross firing machine guns. Looks so real. By the end of the first day, the Marines were holding on by their fingernails. 5,000 had crossed the line of departure. 1,500 had fallen dead or wounded. See the action the going on in the background. Marines brought down snipers and neutralized Japanese bunkers with grenades, TNT, and flamethrowers. A regiment of reserve troops began all here. I heard some Japanese souvenirs that were brought back by Marines. That had survived transfer to the island. That's a Japanese towel. Toward the airfield. Late in the second day, and Shoot, that there is off a Japanese vehicle. Radio the command ship. Got a Japanese helmet. Percentage dead unknown. Combat efficiency. And here's a real Oscar. The Marines had won an Oscar. Shoot was right. For a, a movie they done. It was called uh, a documentary. It was called With the Marines at Tarawa. You can find it on YouTube. Now here's a model of a half track along with a 4th Marine Division patch and a 5th Amphibious Corps patch with the alligator on it. There's another a BAR, which is a Browning automatic rifle along with the ammo belt with it. All right, here's a Purple Heart, some medals, and there's the guy's picture that got the Purple Heart. His name is Corporal Donald Lickrig. I doubt if I pronounced that right, but he was wounded on Saipan in 1944. His Purple Heart was presented to him by a woman, female Marine officer. There's a uh, trouser with a medical tag. You can see the all the blood right there on it. Yeah, sorry about the glare, but here's the uh, a plaque out of the U.S. Marine Barracks Naval Station on Guam. He was able to save this and ship it back to the mainland. Now it's on display here. Nice Japanese flag marked up. It has a, with the writing on it. It would be uh, like a good luck flag. Relatives and friends would sign it. Alright, here's a Marine hiding behind a tank. See, on the back of the tanks, they have uh, little telephones where the Marines on the ground can talk to the tank crew inside. There's the front of it. Okay, now we've got a Bazooka Thompson machine gun. And number eight there is a satchel charge bag. Can't see it too well. There's a really nice painting down here from Norman Rockwell. It's called the War Hero, Homecoming Marine. And a Japanese sword. Machine gun. His glasses. Pipe and a this here's a Japanese toolkit. There's a helmet. Alright, we're getting ready to go in here. They've had a little short movie about Iwo Jima. So, I'll show a little bit of that. Look here. The highest point in the island is Mount Suribachi, an extinct volcano about 550 feet high. 
The only beach suitable for landing runs from the southern tip, some 3,500 yards north on the east side. That's where we're headed. Up here, on the higher ground in the center of the island, the Japanese have built two airfields and are working on a third. Now look at this aerial recon photo. Doesn't look like much is there, right? No barracks, no fortifications, no enemy. Piece of cake, right? Wrong. Everything's underground or dug in under concrete. They've got hundreds of gun emplacements, especially on the southern end of the island, where you'll be landing. Big coastal defense guns, food purpose guns, mortars, machine guns, mines along the beaches and around the airfields. Every rock and cave could be a Japanese soldier fire G2 is calculating somewhere between 21 and 22,000 Japanese troops, the best the enemy's got. And they've had months of turning Iwo Jima into the most heavily fortified island in the Pacific. General Quarters, General Quarters, this is not a drill. All hands man your battle station. All right, people, that's for the swabbies to listen up. Hear those guns? Each of those 16 inch shells is the weight of a car slamming into the enemy. We've been bombing the hell out of Iwo Jima for over seven days. And Navy battleships, cruisers, and destroyers have been pounding the island for the last three days. Softening things up for your men. Navy and Marine planes are going to drag their fellows across that beach before you get there, strafing and bombing. Understand that you're all part of the greatest force ever assembled in the Pacific. 800 ships strong. You're 70,000 fighting Marines from the 4th and 5th Divisions, with the 3rd and Floating Reserve. Okay, that's enough pep. Here's the assault plan. You'll be landing on Green Beach 1, the beach nearest to Mount Sarabachi. Each wave of the initial assault will be landing at 500 minutes. Once you've secured the beach, the Higgins boats will come in with the rest of the troops and LSTs with tanks and artillery. Your immediate objective is to cut across the neck of the island, isolating Surabachi. Then you'll advance up the mountain and take it. Surabachi's gun emplacements are oriented right on the beach, and it's vital you knock them out. There's nothing fancy here. This is a full frontal assault. You've been training for this for a year. You're Marines. You know your job, now go and do it. All Marines and Boat Team 9-4, lay forward immediately to your demarcation station. Okay, Marines. Move out smoking through the hatch and forward your landing. You're on your way to the beach. Alright, as we go exit this area now, we're going to be walking into a landing craft. And then they're going to show a movie up here. Now as you go walking out here, it's like a landing craft. They got the door down. And here's what it looked like what it just come off of. Now check out this battle damaged helmet. There's a map of the 5th Marine Division, 28th Marines flag. It's signed by a lot of veterans. And now we're looking at the original flag that flew on Iwo Jima. Yeah, this is the second flag that flew on Iwo Jima. Here's some 16 millimeter movie camera equipment. This is a speed graphic camera. This is a Bell and Howe. Now, in this here, you can see that it's got. 
Right here you can see the EGAs and there's some uh, Navy insignias. When you take a picture of this with the flash, you'll get an image of the landing craft going into Iwo Jima. You can barely see it in here, but if I would use a flash, I would be able to, it would be like a picture of the invasion. It's really cool, but I'm doing video recording right now, so I can't do it. And we've got a Japanese Nambu pistol. And there's another ceramic grenade. Made them out of ceramic, so they'd be a lot harder to be detected. Some models. All right, here's a front wheel of the uh, amphibious tractor. Really rusty, but got Japanese rifles, bayonets in there. It's, it's hard to see though, it's a lot of glare going on. And here, here's a corpsman's uniform, first marine division. Got a purple heart, a silver star. And you can see it's got the ruptured duck patch on it. That, that means it was honorably discharged after World War II. There's a picture of him. All right, this is a new section that I've never seen before. It's the Navajo Code Talker. And check out that sea bag. A lot of good artwork on there. Navajo code talkers helped win the war because they used their Navajo language and the Japanese was unable to translate it so they had no idea what they were saying. That code was used, was never broken. The Marines offered big money for the capture of somebody who could translate that. There's a model. TBY radio. Oh, you can see it says restricted on it. There's the headphones for it. And there's the radio. Really awesome display. Another Japanese sign flag. Uh, here's a sad display. It's the POWs. If you was a prisoner of Japanese, you were beaten, tortured, and brutally beaten real bad. Starved. Uh, here's some nice Japanese swords in here. Here's a Japanese naval dirk. Real nice display of swords. Some more, two more on, on this side. Can't see the top one too well because of the glare. And up there on the ceiling, I forgot to show you, it's a uh, TBM Avenger torpedo bomber. This one here was one like George Bush Sr. flew during World War II. And he was shot down and rescued by an American submarine. When you're in this museum, you really got to look up also because they got a lot of stuff hanging way up in the ceiling. Uh, right there is where the torpedo would have come out of. They got uh, the doors that would open up. And also, we carry rockets, uh, like four of them on each wing. There's the tail wheel. Right here is where the resting hook would come out when they're landing on an aircraft carrier. Let's stop the plane. All right, here's a Model 1897 Winchester shotgun. They call it a Trent shotgun. And then here's the Collins number 18 knife used by the Raiders. Sheath for it. Now here's a Raider sign Jap flag. It's 
got all the Raider signatures on it. August 17th, 19th, 1942 on Macon Island. 2nd Marine Raider Battalion. Here's a Marine Raider patch. That's a small one that goes on the shirt. And there's a sticker for the Marine Raiders. Well, that's it for the World War II section in here. Pretty awesome. Well, that's the end of this tour for the Marine Corps Museum. Hope you enjoyed it. See you on the next video.